we know that AI is used for a wide range of applications today that people are very excited about. And what I care about is where does the processing for this AI happen? So right now, actually, as it turns out, most of the processing and computing for these AI applications happen in the cloud or in the data center. But there's many compelling reasons why you might want to move this processing out of the data center onto the edge and into your local device. So the first thing is that if we want AI to be accessible to people around the world, we really want it to be less dependent on a strong communication infrastructure, because that's not readily available for everyone. So we really want to bring this processing to the device of these folks. Another reason is that AI plays a large role in many exciting applications like healthcare. And in these applications, you deal with very sensitive data, and you might want to keep the data private on your device. So you might not want to share that with the cloud. So bringing the compute to the data on the device is also important. Finally, there's a lot of applications where we use AI to interact with the real world. So we saw some great talks about robotics this morning, and that's one good example about how we use AI to interact with the real world. And for these applications, uh, the response time is really important. Right? So imagine if you're in a self-driving car and you're going down the highway and you see an obstacle. You might not be able to afford to have the time to send the data to the cloud, let it be processed, and then wait for it to come back to the car itself. Right? So low latency or reducing reaction time is really important. And so putting the compute within the vehicle itself is also important. Now, we want to move the, all of the compute to the device, but one of the key challenges that we have is actually power consumption. So if we take the self-driving car example as, a, as an example again, we know that just to compute all the data that's collecting from all the sensors, it uses over 2,000 watts of power to do that computation. And this typically requires you to fill up the trunk of a car with all the compute, and it burns a lot of heat, and you even need to have some liquid cooling sometimes to manage this. And this is going to be an even more severe challenge when you shrink down the device. For example, to something that's the size of your hand, for example, if you want to do a phone or a smaller uh, robot. And these small form factor or portable devices, you're really limited in terms of how much energy you have because the battery capacity is limited by the size and weight of the device. If you look at existing uh, embedded processors, they actually today consume more than an order of magnitude higher power consumption. That's what's typically allowed or budgeted for these uh, portable devices, which is typically on the order of one watt for compute power. Now, if we think about how we address this over the past few decades, what we would do is we'd wait for Moore's Law and Denard scaling to kick in, and that would give us smaller, faster, and more efficient transistors. But as you can see, over the past decade, this trend has really slowed down. So as a result, we can't rely on more efficient transistors to give us the compute and the energy efficiency that we need for all these exciting applications moving forward. We need to have a new solution. So what we do within my own group is we focus on how do we achieve energy efficient AI in terms of using a cross-layer design approach. That means optimizing across the entire design stack. So I'll get into details about what that is. So the first thing we look at is how do we design new algorithms for processing this data? In particular, we want these algorithms to be both energy efficient and high accuracy. So you want to balance both of these requirements. The next thing that we have to do is we need to build specialized hardware that's really targeted towards processing these AI uh, workloads. So for example, we need to have new compute, compute architectures and new circuits to realize these computer architectures. So in fact, rebuilding the computers from the ground up. And then finally, we want to also consider how to integrate this computing into an actual system. Right? So there's going to be interplay between the compute energy as well as the sensing energy. And if you're talking about robotics, how to interact with the real world, so the actuation energy. So we want a holistic approach of building an energy efficient system. So now I'll highlight a couple of the projects we've been doing in our group to address these challenges. So the first project revolves around deep neural networks. So deep neural networks is a cornerstone of many AI applications, and it's been giving state-of-the-art performance in a wide range of AI tasks. And that's why there's been a huge amount of excitement about this technology. However, the main challenge for deep neural nets is that it's computationally orders of magnitude much more expensive than the typical type of processing you would do on your phone. So for example, video compression. So how are we trying to address this is we want to build specialized hardware to, pro pro uh, to basically process deep neural nets. And really, in the specialized hardware, what we want to focus on is reducing data movement and memory access. And why is that? 
Well, it's because, as it turns out, it actually costs more energy to move data around in the chip than to actually do computations such as a multiply or an add. So we really want to target this data movement. So in collaboration with Joel Emmer, who's in the CSAIL, we've built this chip called IRIS that primarily targets doing energy efficient processing of deep neural networks. And it can do image classification, which is a core task in computer vision, in under a third of a watt. And so when you compare it against existing mobile GPUs, it consumes over an order of magnitude less energy. Another area of interest that we've been looking at is autonomous navigation. So in collaboration with Sirtesh Karaman, who's a roboticist in the Aero Astro department here at MIT, we've been looking at building efficient algorithms and chips for the task of autonomous navigation for very small robots, approximately the size of a quarter, as you can see here in the figure. One of the key tasks for autonomous navigation is the task of localization, basically figuring out where you actually are in the scene. So if you look on the upper right-hand corner of the slide, you can see this video that's going through. That, so this is the video that's being captured on a camera on the drone. And from that, it's going to infer where the drone actually is in the 3D space. And that's the task of the localization. And so this is really important to do, and it's a key aspect of autonomous navigation. And so what we've been doing is through the co-design of both the algorithm as well as the hardware to process this, uh, what's necessary for localization, uh, we've built this chip called Navion, which consumes under a tenth of a watt for localization. So in fact, it's around 24 milliwatts, and it can operate at 170 frames per second. Uh, one of the key ideas that enables us to make this energy efficient is that we integrate everything on chip, so we minimize data movement from on and off chip, which is very expensive. In addition, we also apply some compression techniques to reduce the amount of storage we have on chip. So it stores under a megabyte of data within this small die. And this small chip is only 4 millimeters by 5 millimeters, so 20 centimeters, millimeters square, as you can see here in the figure. And so there's actually a wide range of applications out there that can benefit from this type of processing. In particular, there's a class of low energy robotics that exist where all of these robots consume less than a watt in terms of interacting with the real world. So their actuation power is under a watt. So for example, you have these lighter than air vehicles that can be used for air quality monitoring. Uh, you have miniature satellites that do deep space exploration. And then you have foldable origami robots that can be used for medical applications. And in all these cases, the actuation power is very low. And so it's also really important that we keep the computational power very low. Finally, the one other project we're looking at is how the interaction between energy efficient computing and the application of that into the medical space. So in collaboration with Thomas Helt in the Institute of Medical Engineering and Science here at MIT, we've been looking at how we can apply energy efficient AI for the task of monitoring neurodegenerative diseases. So unfortunately, over 50 million people worldwide suffer today from dementia, and this continues to grow. One of the big challenges is that the assessment of the disease. So when you, you know, might come about having this disease, you need to go in to see a specialist in the clinic. And they ask, might ask you a series of questions and ask you to do some tasks. So this is often time consuming and expensive. So as a result, the, uh, people go in very infrequently, maybe only once or twice. Um, in a year, and you can only get a, a sparse amount of data for this. In addition, it's a very qualitative type of assessment, and so you might get different assessments from different specialists, and even if the same specialist sees you multiple times, you also might, they also might come to different conclusions. So what's been really exciting is that recently people have shown that there's actually also a relationship between eye movement and neurodegenerative diseases. In particular, you can use eye movement to help quantitatively evaluate the state or the severity of the disease. It can be used to evaluate the progression or regression of the disease. So for example, you can imagine you could use this to evaluate whether or not a given drug, drug is working. Um, so right now, though, to do these assessments, it requires specialized hardware, specialized equipment, and cameras, and you need, still need to go into the clinic to go do them. So along with Thomas, what we've been looking at is whether or not we can integrate and perform these tests on the actual smartphone itself. Um, and so you can imagine this would be very low cost. You could do this in the comfort of your own home, and you can have many frequent measurements. And of course, what's really critical here is that you still need to do the process on the device itself because you're capturing very sensitive information. And this would be, the outcome of this would be um, helpful information to go in conjunction with the clinician's assessment. So in summary, energy-efficient AI enables us to extend the reach of AI beyond the cloud by reducing the reliance on communication infrastructure, by enabling privacy, reducing latency, so that we could use AI in a wide range of applications, ranging from robotics to healthcare. 
And the key to enabling us to achieve energy efficient AI is through a cross layer design approach, looking from the algorithms all the way down to specialized hardware. And we believe that this is going to be critical for the progress of AI over the next decade. Thank you very much. Thank you.